I write this piece of software and try to sell it, the market size is very well known. I could generate about $3 million per year with this software. Gross revenue for a company trying to sell this revenue, which is, in California is not very much money. However, I, do the, I write the same program, same amount of work. If I do it for a semiconductor manufacturer, then that same piece of software will not generate $3 million a year in revenue. It will be used to design and sell over a billion dollars a year in ICs. And that's the reason why LT Splice is the fastest, most accurate, most numerically bust robust spice program. Now that reason instances out to technical things in the way that it is implemented. And so in this part of the talk, I want to outline what is technically different um, in LT spice versus the spice programs that you can buy from a software company. All right, there are three different algorithms that make a SPICE program. There's Newton iteration, sparse matrix methods, and implicit integration. If you have a piece of software that has those three methods implemented in them, you have a piece of software that will compute the large signal behavior of arbitrary nonlinear circuits. And if you look at how those three algorithms are implemented, you can see, you can ascertain that one SPICE program is better than another. Now let's talk about Newton iteration. That's named after the um, I don't know, the minister of the mint in the Tower of London. That was his job. He was the, he was the I forget, not minister of mint, or he, he was the director, or the manager of the mint, who printed all the money in, um, in England. Sir Isaac Newton. Now, this is the simplest circuit I can contrive that will expose the algorithm. You have a diode and a current source. Simulate that voltage. LTSPICE uses an iterative method to find that voltage. And in fact, if you do it by pencil and paper, it's iterative also. Diodes don't have exponential IV curves. So that's a transcendental problem. There's no other way of solving that without iteration. Now, the way that um, uh, SPICE solves that circuit is, is that it expands the uh, L IV curve of the diode as a Taylor series. Let me um, uh, draw a little picture here. This is the current as a function of the voltage. And the IV curve of a diode you know, would look like that. The, um, um, what you do is you assume a Taylor function. This can be expressed as a Taylor function. And, and that Taylor function would look like, if I label one point on this, this is V0 and this is I0 then the current is I0 plus V minus V0 times DI DV plus one half V minus V0 squared D squared I DV squared, where these derivatives are evaluated at uh, V equals V0. Okay, you assume this exists and um, then you just keep the first two terms, okay? That is, you replace the IV curve with an IV line. That's exact where you, you know, about this one point and close for small per perturbations around it. And you, um, you assume this point about which you've, you, you guess that this point, you don't assume, you guess that this point is the right solution. You assume that's where it's biased. Okay, and you say, okay, well, I, I'm going to use this, the first two terms of the Taylor series, a zero order and first order term, and these two terms, that's a Norton equivalent circuit. There's a current and there's a conductivity. So I can replace the diode with this Norton equivalent circuit that gives an IV curve about a guest point on the, uh, 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 it gives an IV line on a guest point of the IV curve. All right, now if I do that for every single nonlinearity of circuit, I'm going to have a linear system. And I can set up a system of simultaneous linear equations. 
It'll look like GV equals I, G, uh, Gs and Is, those are the Norton equivalent circuits, and V is the point about which I expanded those, uh, those IV curves to IV lines. And then if I solve this matrix, if this voltage is the voltage about which I expanded it, that's it, I found the solution. Newton iteration results in a, numer in a numerical proof that it found the answer. It's a powerful argument. It says, look, I got some nonlinear system. I'm going to approximate the nonlinear system about a guessed bias point. And they get my, uh, my expansion or my approximation to the nonlinear system is exact where I have expanded it, and it's close for small perturbations around it. Now, if I use that approximation to the circuit as what the circuit is and solve for where it ought to be biased, and it actually ought to be biased where I guessed it is, well, that's it. It's a proof. You found it. That's the point, the Newton iteration. It results in a numerical proof you found the answer. Now, if this voltage is not the voltage at which you found this, Newton iteration prescribes a way of finding a new point to guess and look at another thing. That's Newton iteration. And if you do this, you can solve for the uh, bias point of an arbitrary nonlinear system. Now, that sounds so much different than what we learned in school or what we learned in university. Americans say, call university and school the same thing. You may not, I don't know. Anyway, at university, we all had a course in, numer in, in, in linear algebra. You know, we learned more about linear, linear algebra than we wanted to rank, file, order, determinants, transposing, uh, you know, eliminating unknowns, solving them. Okay, we did it. We learned it. We got through university. Now, on the last day of class, the professor told you, now, this is the way it works for a linear system. If you have a nonlinear system, we're going to wish you a lot of luck with that. Okay. Yet, yeah, here's some method which solves for the, uh, solves for the uh, large signal behavior of some arbitrary nonlinear system. Now, how can both of these things be true on the same planet? Well. There's a, there's a trick here, and that is this circuit works well for a, this system works well for a electronic circuit, but an electronic circuit is not a general nonlinear system. It is a very specific type of nonlinear system, and what's so unique about it is that all the IV curves are smoothly varying and continuous, okay? So it's, if, if your system is differentiable, you can prove you found the solution of the circuit. If you can't differentiate your curves everywhere, then you can never prove you've actually found the solution of the circuit. That's what it relies on. The proof will not, the, the argument that you found the right solution will not be, uh, 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 will not be valid. All right, now, that's where you get into the differences between SPICE programs. The robustness of your SPICE solver depends on whether or not the IV curves are continuous in value and slope. Now, a real circuit, they're all continuous in value and slope, but the software has bugs in them that, so that they're not continuous in value and slope. For example, Berkeley SPICE has a discontinuity in its IV curve for a diode. That's what Berkeley SPICE does, okay? It's just a bug in the program, okay? And that bug is in uh, I believe it's in every commercial SPICE program I'm aware of, okay? LT SPICE doesn't have it. I'm from UC Berkeley. I'm familiar with these bugs. That bug is not there. So now this is just for an IV, uh, IV curve of a diode, but this spills over to every single semiconductor in Berkeley SPICE. The BJT. Like huh? So how can they sell something like this? Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, This is uh, when you reverse bias it. When you reverse bias a diode in Berkeley Spice, all of a sudden it will just completely turn off. Okay, it won't, it won't smoothly turn off. It just, snap, it just snaps off in its IV curve. It's a fairly small discontinuity, but it's in every semiconductor. You know, it's in the diode, it's in the BJT, it's in the JFET, it's in the substrate of the MOSFET. This discontinuity is in BSIM-3, and it's in BSIM-4 and that's in every single semiconductor of every single commercial device. That's just the PN junction. Here, here's the output characteristics of a MOSFET. This is the um, um, channel length punch through on a MOSFET. Uh, this is a discontinuity in value. The slope is continuous, but the value is not. Uh, it's supposed to look like that, 
But in Berkeley Spice and every single spice program I've ever seen, that's the, the IV curves of the diode during channel uh, length punch through. And other, other MOSFETs have other problems. Here's a discontinuity in slope, though, though not value. And you'll see it in P spice and H spice and everything else. All right. That's where you get the robustness. Now, the speed of your solver comes down to how fast you can compute and solve. See, all the, you're doing all your computation here. The rest of this is a theoretical argument. This is where you're working the numbers. Is, is when you, um, is, and the speed comes down to how fast you can compute and solve the matrix. So let's, let me dwell on this. Yeah, it's the time to compute the matrix and the time to solve the matrix. Those are actually different things. Computing the matrix means computing these coefficients, you know, computing this uh, conductivity times unknown voltage equals known currents. So these are the Norton equivalent circuits, all those conductivities and all those currents. It basically comes down to how fast you can linearize all the um, transcendentals of your uh, IV curves of your semiconductors. That's what computing the matrix does. And once you've set up the matrix, you have to solve it, okay? Now for compu computation, LT Spice is a multi-threaded solver. Uh, it was probably the first multi-threaded solver. Others have come later, but uh, LT Spice, because all these things can be computed in parallel or independently, they're done in, in parallel threads. Uh, for solving the matrix, LT Spice does a very ambitious and fancy thing. It does self-authoring code. That means, see the thing is, here's the problem. If you want to see how long it would take to solve this matrix, what you should do is look at the number of clock cycles it takes to do one floating point operation and then multiply that number of clock cycles times the number of floating point pay, uh, operations you have to do to eliminate all the no, uh, uh, unknowns uh, and uh, back substitute to uh, find them. And then that's the number of floating point operations. And then you multiply the number of operations you have to do times the number of clock cycles it takes per floating point operation times the, times the length of one clock period. That gives you a time and tells you how long it should take to solve this matrix. Then if you time it with a stopwatch, you'll find it takes between three and five times longer than that. Now the reason is, um, uh, the reason is that the, it, it takes longer to take this data, to get this data to the floating point operation than it does to do the floating point operation. It takes longer to get the data to the floating point unit than the do to flop. You have to consider the timing of a current processor. Now you know, you know the clock period of a processor. All the processors run at 3.3 gigahertz, have for a long time. Your period is 300 picoseconds. That's basically a fixed number at this point. Now, we've been doing integer math at microwave frequencies for, for decades. That's how fast you can do, uh, it takes 300 picoseconds to do integer math. You know, but to do a floating point operation, we need to find out how many floating point, how many clock cycles are required to do a floating point operation. And it actually depends on the type of floating point operation you need to do. What you do to eliminate unknowns in this matrix is you do addition, subtraction and multiplication. Those are the three floating point operations you do. There's a few divisions, but not very many. There's one division per unknown, but basically you're adding, subtracting, and multiplying. So let me ask you, say you have two 64-bit double precision numbers and you want to multiply them with your floating point unit to a 64-bit double precision accurate result. How many of these 300 picoseconds are required to do that? Do you folks know? Does anybody want to guess for fun? You're mad at me. You're still mad about the penguins. That's it. <laughs> See, usually a person would guess, right? If I were to ask a person, you, you would have an opinion on this, a number came to your mind. What would you, what do you say? I know many clock cycles, but under three. No one, it's three. <laughs> no one ever gets it right. I've heard per, a person say four. But it's three clock cycles. That's how many latent clock cycles there are at the end of the pipeline. It's mind-boggling. I mean, I would not have expected that either. I would have thought hundreds. 
Uh, but you know, I, I've read the assembly language manual to Intel processors, and yes, there's three latent clock cycles at the end of the pipeline, and that is mind-boggling. I mean, how would you do that? You know, but that's what. It did you know the answer? Or did you just guess? Yes. You guessed. You're good. <laughs> You're good. You know, ignorance is like a virtue. It is its own reward. You know. <laughs> so anyway, it takes three, but. That's the good news. The bad news is that in the next many clock cycles, nothing happens because the pipeline is empty. So uh, the reason why the pipeline is empty is because of dynamic memory allocation. See, the thing is, when a person is writing the code to, sol to uh, solve this matrix, well, I mean, he can't give every coefficient its own name. There's too many of them, so he has to use arrays. And so he's going to, he doesn't know how many, how big the circuit is when he writes the matrix solver. So he, he doesn't know um, uh, where the memory is. He's going to get, he's going to ask Malik for some memory. And he doesn't know the address that came back from Malik. So when you're writing this matrix solver, you don't know the address of the data. All you know is the address of the base address of which you must index to get the actual data to say what has to be you know, moved into the uh, floating point processor. And it, you know, resolving all of that pointer chasing in direction at runtime takes a lot longer than three clock cycles, you know, because you have to fire traces on the motherboard and all this sort of stuff to get that data in there. Okay. And there is nothing you can do to fix that problem. Even if you write the entire matrix solver in perfectly optimized assembly language, if you don't know the address that Malik returned, you don't know where the data is. There's nothing you can do unless you write the program after you call Malik. And that's what LT Spice is doing. When you poke the running man, you know, there's a net list that's parsed and data is stored and it allocates a, a, a matrix space. And after, it, after that's done, that's when LT Spice writes the solver for that circuit. It actually authors an assembly language program that will uh, has, you know, can resolve all these addresses in line with the code of what, what operations to do. And then it assembles it, and then it links it, and calls the address from the linker as the thing that solves your circuit, self-author an assembly language. And that allows LT Spice to run the processor at the theoretical flop limit theoretical flop, flop limit, and means it can do floating point math above NATO C-band frequencies. That's what it's doing. So, you know, you have to think it's really important to have the world's fastest spice to write self off in assembly language in your software. You, know, this, you, you won't find that in, um, in other solvers. Okay. Now, um, oh, this is, yes, this is a good time to talk about this would be a good time to uh, figure out how to make a faster SPICE program. The thing is, since this is the thing that SPICE is spending all of its time on, think about how to make a faster SPICE program. Okay, and when you want to think about, when usually when you get into talk about uh, algor the speed of an algorithm, you usually want to talk about the order of the algorithm. And the order of an algorithm is a way of describing how the solution time increases with problem size. You know, if the problem is 10 times as big, is it going to take 10 times as long to solve? Well, that'd be great. That would be a linear algorithm. And that's as good as it gets. You know, if you do 10 times as much work and 10 times as much time, there's no volume discount in numerical methods, that's as good as it gets. But that's not usually the way it is. Most algorithms are not linear algorithms. Now, when you solve a matrix, there's various ways, methods of solving matrices. Uh, the one they teach us in university is usually an abomination. I think it's close to n factorial, meaning that if you have more than a few unknowns, you can't solve it. You just run into a brick wall. Okay. If you have um, uh, it, you know, the, the fastest way of doing it is an algorithm called upper lower factorization, LU factorization, and with that you can get into n log squared. And n log squared is probably as good as you're going to do because as this matrix increases with size, as you have more unknown voltages in your circuit, each unknown is harder to eliminate and you have more unknowns. So LU factorization is probably the, um, uh, it's the fastest known way today and from first principles, it's, it kind of makes me think it probably will remain the fastest way of uh, solving a matrix. Okay. 
Now, n factor, or n squared isn't that bad, but um, it's not that good either. And eventually what this means is that as you have a very big circuit, eventually you're gonna spend time, more time solving the matrix than, than computing it, okay? And that will take over the solution time. And um, that, uh, uh, you know, okay. So what this means is if you have a really big simulation, it takes a long time to solve, the problem is not all those surface mount components. The problem is the number of unknown voltages, the number of copper traces underneath them. That's what it means. And that might be you know, entertaining to know that, because it's probably not something you've thought of before. But what value is there in dwelling on that? I mean, okay, sure, fine. Say you have 10 diodes. Okay, if you put them all in series, it'll take one length of time to solve. But if you put them all in parallel, it'll simulate a lot faster. That may well be true, but that's a different circuit than the one you were interested in. So what, um, uh, um, you know, basically what I'm saying is that if you want your simulations to run faster, you should reduce the temperature of your reflows wave soldering machines so that the whole back is all solder bridged together. It'll simulate really fast, that's true, but how is that useful? Well, uh, yes, you do have to use smaller matrices to write a faster uh, uh, simulator program, and there's one place where you can use smaller matrices without changing the circuit. And that place where you can use smaller matrices without changing the circuit deals with the way that reactances are integrated. Now, when you have these um, you know, capacitors and inductors, you give rise to these uh, differential equations. You have to integrate them to give rise to the, uh, the you know, you have to, uh, these give rise to differential equations. You have to integrate the charge and fluxes to know how these reactances impact your circuit. Once you integrate them, you have to put the solution of the integration of the differential equations in that GV equals I matrix, which means you have to, you know, put them in, which are, GV equals I is just gonna be more Norton equivalent circuits, okay? So, you integrate the thing and you, and, you put, and you stamp it into the matrix as a Norton equivalent circuit. Now that doesn't seem as nonsensical as, you, as you'd think because you know, this is not a reactance and this is supposed to you know, look like a reactance. Well, the, the thing is you use a different Norton equivalent circuit for every time step and every time step size. You know, the, uh, the Norton equivalent circuit, you could put the, uh, the voltage across the Norton equivalent circuit to correspond to the charge history on the capacitor. That's pretty clear you can do that. And it would you know, look like you know, uh, uh, a source of some impedance for that time step. And you use a different impedance on the capacitor so that, and the size of the impedance of the capacitor depends on the size of the time step you're taking. You know, if you take a really big time step, then this Norton equivalent circuit doesn't have very much impedance and you can have a big change in voltage across the capacitor in that long time step. But if you take a very short time step, the voltage across the cap is the same, but it's a, more, uh, it's a lower impedance Norton equivalent circuit because it starts looking like an AC short. So yes, you can report the solution of the integration of the differential equations as a of a capacitor as a Norton equivalent circuit if you use the right Norton equivalent circuit for every time step and time step size. It's possible, you know simulators can do it because they do it, so that's the way it's done. Great. Now. If you have a circuit like, well, the thing is, every SPICE program in the world has exactly one integrator in them, okay? So they run the same integra integrator over every reactance in the circuit. So if you have a circuit like this, this might be the output filter cap of a Swiss mode power supply. So you have a bulk in, uh, capacitance, ESR, internal inductance, shunt capacitance, and maybe some leakage. This thing here will be reported as a Norton, uh, will be reported to the, uh, uh, the solution of the integration of the differential equations of this structure will be reported as this structure. See, the solution of the integration of the differential equations of that bulk capacitance is reported as that Norton equivalent circuit. Solution of the integration of the differential equations of that reactance is reported as that Norton equivalent circuit circuit. This goes literally into the matrix without modification of this inductor. You can use the same inductor for, you can use the same integrator for inductors that you use for capacitors if you do a change of variables and use the result as a Thevenin equivalent circuit instead of a Norton equivalent circuit. And so this structure will be reported as this structure in every single SPICE program in the world because every single SPICE program in the world has one 
salt, one integrator that's used over every reactants. And this has three internal nodes, one, two, three, okay? That's the way every SPICE program in the world works except LT-SPICE. LT-SPICE doesn't have one integrator in it. It has 36 different integrators that integrates different two-terminal linear networks to one Norton equivalent circuit with no internal nodes, and that is why it runs faster, because it doesn't have internal nodes. Okay? Now, clear it's faster. But what happens to the accuracy? All right, now here, there's this glaring conflict of interest, you know. Um, see, the thing is, I'm the one that invented this algorithm. So if I stand here and tell you, oh, and this is why it runs faster, and then I say, oh, and it's just as accurate, you might not believe me. You know, because there's a glaring conflict of interest. I would love you to think that it's just as accurate because it's clearly faster. Well, and, and um, so I'm going to have to talk about this enough so that you can come to your own conclusion about speed versus accuracy. And I'm going to do this with a technique called what we call an American legal system called a change in venue. Okay, it usually comes from uh, criminal case prosecution. Say you have some heinous crime that's com been committed and everybody's read the paper, everybody knows what's happened, everybody's made up the decision that this guy's guilty. How are you gonna give this guy a fair trial? Because in the United States we have trial by jury, not by judge, or you, there's an option between trial by jury. So you can't get a jury if everyone has read about the case and the paper has already made up its mind. So that's when you have a change in venue. You take the guy, you take the, the criminal to a different county and you have the trial there, then you find him guilty and you kill him. Okay, that's, that's a change in venue. Now, um, so let's first talk about what we should expect, you know, by looking at numerical methods. And so let's talk about a numerical method I didn't invent and uh, let's see how that impacts accuracy. Let's specifically talk about the FFT, okay? We know the FFT is, is fast, but what about the accuracy? Say you do have a discrete sample data set and you want to know the Fourier transform of the discrete sample data set. Should you use the FFT or should you um, compute, the products, uh, compute all the products and sum the series and get the FFT from, uh, get the, 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 uh, the DFT from definition? Which would you think is more accurate? FFT or definition? And once again, come on. You still mad at me? Huh? I'm sorry? Definition. definition. Okay, he says definition. How many people say definition? Are you scratching your ear or cleaning your ear or you're saying definition? Oh, I shouldn't hit him. He looks like a deer with his in the headlight. Okay. How many people say that the FFT is faster? Four people. So you guys do digital signal processing? Yeah. Anyone who does digital signal processing knows that the FFT is more accurate. Um, it's a famous result of digital signal processing. The FFT isn't just more accurate, it's fantastically more accurate. And the reason is it has so much less math to do, there's less round off error. Okay, so the FFT isn't just faster, it's more accurate because it has less round off error. See, the thing is, it, it's like this. When those guys, Turkey and Cooley, published that paper in the 60s, uh, uh, outlining the FFT, you know, they had this theory of how the FFT works, and they had a program listing. You could actually walk up to a computer, type this in, and see the FFT was just blindly fast. Okay, well, when they wrote that paper, and um, uh, if you were in the field of numerical computation at the time when that paper came out, there's only one reaction to that paper which makes any sense at all. And that is to be vividly jealous you didn't think of it first. I mean, you know, if you had a pulse, you should have been jealous that you didn't. I mean, it's just, now, had that paper read along these lines, oh, you guys, you, you better check this out. This is fast. But it's not as accurate then the reaction of everyone else in the field of numerical computation, their reaction would be, it's not as accurate. It's not as accurate. 
We've seen this before. There are trades in life. You can have something very, very cheap or very, uh, very, you can have something very high quality or very inexpensive. You know, there's trades in life. You could, you can marry somebody rich or you can marry somebody beautiful. Okay, I mean, there's just, there's just <laughs> trades in life. Okay, you know, your, your algorithm is very clever, but we've really seen this before. Well, that was not the situation. It was both fantastically faster and more accurate than anything we'd done before, and that. Uh, that's, uh, if, in fact, the matter is, if it were faster but not as accurate, it might have been forgotten. You, know, you might never have heard of the FFT again, because if that, you know, the FFT has already been forgotten once. Uh, Gauss invented it 100 years earlier, and people forgot about it. You know, but uh, uh, no, it was faster and it was more accurate. And uh, it actually it showed that there was a whole field that people didn't know about. The, um, the, the FFT is the origin of the field of numerical methods, okay? And that's exactly what's happening here. I have less math to do. You know I have less math to do because it runs faster. So I have less runoff error, so it's more accurate. Now this is actually an interesting situation in accuracy because, um, because of the nature of the application of the circuit that I'm solving, this method can be so much more accurate, it can be the difference between being able to solve a circuit or not. Uh, and let's just consider, um, let's not consider this whole circuit, let's just consider a bulk capacitance and an ESR. Should you try to report it as this circuit, or should you report it as that circuit? And let's say the output, let's say this is the output filter cap with a switchboard power supply, the bulk capacitance is a thousand microfarad and the ESR is one ohm. Completely practical values, you know, back when I invented this algorithm 20 years ago. Well, okay, so you have this thousand microfarad and one ohm resistor, and you're simulating this with an, the integrated circuit that's, you know, that's a controller for the switchboard power supply. And that integrated circuit has these submicroscopic transistors with real fast rise times on their, on their drains. You know, you could have a rise time of, a, of 100 picoseconds on an integrated circuit. It's a completely casual thing to happen, so it happens all the time. Now, when you have this very fast rise time on this drain of this submicroscopic transistor on the integrated circuit, then the simulator has to take these little bitty tiny short time steps to follow the, you know, to integrate the charge on those uh, uh, transistor capacitances as, as it goes through that rise time. And it's actually by integrating those differential equations that the simulator knows it takes 100 picoseconds and not one picosecond or, or 100 years. By integrating those equations, that's how it does it. That's how it solves that, uh, what the rise time is. Okay. Now, when it's taking those itty bitty uh, time steps, it could be picosecond, could be a femtosecond, when it's doing those time, short time steps, it has to solve the whole circuit. In some place in that circuit is that thousand microfarad. Well, the equivalent, if, when you integrate this uh, thousand microfarad and report the solution of the integration of the differential uh, equations of the thousand microfarad, you end up with you know, over the period of a femtosecond, it looks like an astronomically dead short circuit. You know, this could be a conductivity of, it could be conductivity of 10 to the 10, okay? Now, um, someplace else, that means that some of these uh, G coefficients, they'll have an order of 10 to the 10. Someplace else on the circuit, there might be a, a one mega ohm resistor completely practical value, and it has a conductivity not of 10 to the 10, but 10 to the minus 6. So these G coefficients range from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the minus 6. And at that point, that matrix is numerically singular. You cannot eliminate unknowns. I mean, when you solve a matrix, you take one row scale and subtract it from another row, and you can't subtract 10 to the minus 6 from 10 to the 10 and have a different bit pattern if you're using 64-bit double precision math. That's the problem. But same circuit, same passage in the simulation data. If you do this, that may have a conductivity of 10 to the 10, but that has the ESR, which is one ohm, which is 10 to the zero. So that's 10 to the zero. And that means this matrix goes not from 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the minus six, but 10 to the zero to 10 to the minus six. And that's 10 digits of improved accuracy. And that's the difference in being able to solve the circuit or not. That's actually why I invented the algorithm. There was, I was looked at conversion problems in, uh, uh, from IC designers. 
I'd have to single step through the thing with the debugger. And I looked at it and says, oh, of course this method fails. I'm going to have to reformulate the, the circuit matrix. And um, yeah, the method was invented for its accuracy, not its speed, but it, it speed things up too. What this means to you is when you're going to, uh, when you put a, a capacitor in a simulation and you want to consider its ESR, do not put the ESR as a discrete lump constant drafted on the schematic. Use assisted mode. Here. Um, you know, here is the ESR. Right click on the capacitor and use assisted mode. That allows LT Spice to include the ESR and the capacitor together. It means LT Spice is going to use a different integrator for that part and combine them. And I can show, I can demonstrate the difference in accuracy here um, in a simple circuit. This is a capacitive voltage divider. That component is the same as that component. So if I put a signal in here, node B should be down by exactly a factor of two from whatever signal I put in here. And over here I have exactly the same circuit, but I put the ESR as discrete lump constant, and that prevents LT spice from integrating them together because I've explicitly put this node in the circuit. All I have to do is run this simulation from inspection and know the solution is that node B, both of these intermediate nodes, should be precisely minus 6.02 plus change down. Okay? Let's run the simulation. And you see node B is exactly the right number, and node A has errors up to 10 dB just because you're running out of dynamic range when you're trying to solve the matrix. Okay, so that's, that's a demonstration of the accuracy. Now, this is a good point to point out that, a good time to point out that LT Spice actually includes two different Spice programs. At analog devices, we developed a sparse matrix solver that has remarkably less round off error than a normal sparse matrix solver. It uses a more introspective algorithm for auto uh, eliminate a node and, and so on. Uh, that matrix solver is very clever, but it was incompatible with SPICE, so we actually wrote another version of SPICE that will link against this other very clever matrix solver. And let's see what that will do in this situation. Where you get to that other matrix solver, you go to the control panel, SPICE, engine. These two solvers have the highly descriptive names, descriptive names of normal and alternate. <laughs> the alternate solver uses the other sparse matrix solver. It runs slower because it uses this more introspective algorithm, but it does have more accuracy. And you can see that you can uh, uh, greatly eliminate the round off error. It's still not perfect. I mean, anytime you're trying to do uh, numerical simulation, if you could reformulate the circuit matrix to, uh, to avoid a problem, that's the thing you should do. But with brute force, you can improve the thing. All right. So now we're going to talk about the last part of, of Spice Solver, implicit integration. But this is the way you, OK, I said how the, uh, I talked about new iteration. I talked about sparse matrix methods. I talked about uh, reporting the solution of integration of the differential equations to the matrix. Now I'm going to talk about how you're actually going to integrate the differential equations. Now, in, in university, we learned, you know, we studied calculus, and somewhere in there they talked about integrating differential equations, you know, and the problem they gave was always a cannonball and a gravitational field. You know, you had a cannonball at that position going in that direction at that speed. Next time step, it was at that position, that direction, and that speed. Next time step is at that position, that direction, and that speed. And you extrapolate time step to time step and compute the path of the cannonball. That's explicit integration. And we learned all these different methods of doing explicit integration, you know, uh, Euler, midpoint, modified midpoint, Runge-Kutta, and so on. A whole, you know, we just learned a half a dozen different ways of integrating differential equations. And when we're done, we feel like we're armed to integrate differential equations. And then we have to go get a job, and we find that those methods all fail miserably. See, explicit integration, when you explicitly extrapolate one time step from the one in front of it, that works very well for a cannonball and a gravitational field or planetary uh, motion, you know, where people are differential equations were first uh, applied. But 
not that many things, uh, not that very many physical problems have solutions that look like eclipses or hyperbola, okay? Most physical systems have, uh, you know, being the terrestrial base species we are, most terrestrial, most terrestrial differential equations are differential equations that look like a decaying exponential, you know, thermal problems, RC circuits, you know, it's all decaying exponential. Solution looks like decaying exponential. It doesn't look like a, um, um, a, a circle or a parabola or an ellipse. Now, if your solution looks like, if the true solution of the system you're trying to integrate looks like a decaying exponential, if you use explicit integration, your errors can add up exponentially with time until you have more error than solution and shortly after that happens, the thing will simply diverge off to infinity. Your numerically integrated result will simply run off the end of the number line. Uh, now, to avoid that, you have to use implicit integration. And in implicit integration, you don't extrapolate each time step to, uh, to get the next time step. You say, okay, it's, it's in this state, it's in this position, velocity and direction, and it's going to be in some unknown position, velocity and direction, and I will find what derivatives I need to get there. I'll set up a system of equations and solve this matrix and find the next time step, you know, implicitly finding the derivatives I get, you use to get to that next time step. That is implicit integration. And there, there just aren't that many implicit integration methods. Um, in circuit simulation, you usually see two. One is called trap, which is short for trapezoidal, and the other is gear, which is a person's name. Now trap, most vice programs will give you two. Trap is faster than gear, but it's more accurate. Does that, that doesn't quite sound right. Okay, gear is slower than trap, but it's less accurate too. That's actually what it is. Gear is basically stuck on stupid integration. It, it, it takes longer to do, and it doesn't give you the right answer when it's done. Yes. Now, the reason why both are available is because trap integration can have a numerical artifact which is not very palatable. Say the correct continuous time integrated solution looks like this. Well. Trap can use unfortunate endpoints for the trapezoids. There's one trapezoid. There's another trapezoid. There's another trapezoid. There's another trapezoid. And so on. Now, it's the correct answer. All these areas are correct. It's the right answer. It's correctly integrated, but if you uh, just plot the resultant waveform here, it oscillates time step to time step about you know the correct continuous time solution. Now, a lot of engineers, a lot of analog engineers, are going to look at this. And they look at I got this RC time constant, and it's oscillating time step to time step about what it should look like. This RC time constant. They would look at this and say. Some software guy wrote this thing. He has no idea what I do for a living. He'll throw away the result. He'll discard it, even though it is the correct answer. So, um, hence gear integration. Gear was developed. Gear integration was developed for chemical process control, and it just deliberately dampens everything because he knows the answer is going to look like a decaying exponential. So he'll just dampen the equations. He'll actually add damping to the physical system, so that doesn't happen. Um, if you have a simulator that supplies both gear and trap, make sure you get the same answer with both. Then you avoid, the, then you're running the thing with sufficiently small time steps so that gear gives the right answer and you haven't run into trap integration. If they both give the same answer, you can be confident you have the right answer. But uh, what you'd really like is something that could actually just integrate the differential equations and give you the right answer. That's, that's clearly what you would want. And that's what modified trap is. Uh, modified trap is proprietary to LT Spice. It's a method we invented for LT Spice. I, something I invented it for LT Spice. And modified trap is fast, it's accurate, it's the most accurate way of integrating differential equations. As far as I know, there's no demand. And um, 
that's a, that's a big deal. LT spice can actually integrate differential equations. Spice programs don't actually get it right. Let me uh, draw a little bit more on the problem with gear integration. Look at this circuit. From inspection, you know the solution of this circuit. See, this is a tank circuit and a pulse current source. T equals zero, it's zero current. At 100 microseconds, it's 100 milliamps. At 200 microseconds, it's zero current. Thereafter, it's zero current, and thereafter, if you have a current source of zero current, it means it's not there. And so what happens is this puts a spike of current into this tank circuit, sets up a ringing, and then it should ring at that constant amplitude forevermore because there's no loss mechanism in this tank circuit. Okay, from inspection, you know the solution of the circuit. Now let's look at the numerically integrated result. Uh, LT Spice, that's exactly what it does. It rings at a constant amplitude for all time. Uh, LT Spice conserves energy and uh, you know, does charge and, and um, energy conservation in the, in the inductor, so it will literally ring at the same amplitude forever. If you run that circuit in H Spice, it will slowly decay because that will, they will dampen the trap integration slightly and if you look at the health file, there's a, there's a number you can set in LT Spice to duplicate the damping of H Spice in case you're interested in doing something like that. But LT Spice basically just gives you the correct answer. If you use gear integration, which up until recently was the only thing P Spice would do, only gear, you could see the thing dampen the oscillation. And this is a substantial uh, amount of damping. Now here, this is a simple circuit. So the solver should be able to figure out how to use a time step so it doesn't damp. But, and, and so it just, you know, it's a, it's a fairly high Q um, loss, but it's still uh, uh, pretty sizable. But if you have a more complicated circuit, it doesn't take a very much more complicated circuit to completely fool gear integration so it can't get the job right at all. And take this circuit. I mean, it's a, it's a simple circuit, but it's more complicated than a tank circuit. This is uh, an audio amplifier. You know, diff pair, uh, Miller multiplied dominant pole, and then a voltage follower stage, emitter follower, voltage follower stage. Right? You could build this thing, it'll amplify with a couple, couple line outputs here, transistor amplifier. Now, there's a, there's a bug in this program. This circuit doesn't work right because this, this uh, Miller multiplied cap, that 10 picofarad is not large enough. That's supposed to be the dominant pole and this circuit will oscillate if you build this thing. It should be more like 30 puff, not 10 puff. And if you run it with gear integration, which is what all P-Spice does, you will get, you will see the thing look perfectly stable, but if you run an LT-Spice, so it will immediately expose the fact it's unstable. And since you know how much I like doing st transient analysis for stability, this is kind of a big thing to me, you know. And um, uh, since IC designers do it this way, I've seen IC designers design a circuit, lay it out, get it fab, come back, and it oscillates because we used in gear integration. It's, uh, it's happened in very many times. So this is, this is a topic that's real important to be able to integrate the equations correctly, and that's what LT Splice does. This is a case of a modified trap. This is a diabolical circuit that shows, you can see this is LT Splice doing trap ringing here. I just zoomed up on that region here. And, uh, and the, the default method in LT Splice is modified trap, and it will not ring like that. So that's, what, uh, that's the difference between modified trap and trap, is that it will never show that trap ringing and just, just for comparison, I tried running the same circuit. The circuit is actually diabolical. It's a very large, very thin MOSFET. This is like um, a fraction of a millimeter on a side MOSFET with uh, a, a TOX of 20 nanometer and uh, no subthreshold conduction. So the circuit is actually just exotically difficult to solve because it's so nonlinear, so it's extremely nonlinear capacitance. This is not a practical circuit. It's just a numerical example to show trap ringing. But I wanted to see what this would look like with gear integration. So I tried it in P-Spice, and P-Spice, it turns out there was a different problem. P-Spice doesn't have a, a correct yang Chatterjee model in it, all the partial compat. Okay, wait. MOSFETs, uh, did you uh, use a, a charge model called yang Chatterjee, which is a, a, a charge-based model, which means that it should conserve charge. But to use it, you have to differentiate the charge with respect to every voltage. You get the capacitance right, and there's bugs. There's different bugs in the piece by solver. Can't correctly integrate the Yang energy charge model. All righty. The reason why I use LT, uh, P Spice, go to LT Spice is because basically anyone who does circuit simulation knows that P Spice is actually the worst spice program in the industry. That's, that's why I use it. Um, 
they were the first out of PC, but it is, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a reviewed public knowledge thing that PSPICE is actually the worst SPICE program. All right, so Newton iteration, that's where you get the robustness, sparse reflex methods, that's where you get the speed, implicit integration, that's where you get the integrity that you can believe the result if, it, if you can get to an answer. So LT SPICE is the fastest, most accurate, most numerically robust SPICE program, and it's a statement I don't see myself having to back off from. Yeah.